Thursday, December 14th, and look who's here. It is F.P. Santangelo, not a talking head in a box, but a physical person I can reach out and touch. He's right here. He's still alive. He hasn't been so laid off. He's vanished. Hi, F.P. Dude, this is like Wayne's World. Isn't it? Yeah, Wayne's World. Excellent. <laughs> Party on. No, thanks for having me. This is great, man. It's been so long. Well, we've run into each other at some functions in San Francisco, but I remember when I first started uh, in radio, uh, you and I crossed paths a lot, uh, and then I went back east for a while, and we've stayed in touch. So I can't thank you enough for having me here, dude. This is really cool. Well, I'm telling you, I feel like this is the official exit interview. After today, you can say you're no longer at KNBR because this is now the destination for anyone who's been laid off in radio in the Bay Area <laughs> to come on and you can air as many grievances or show your feats of strength, whatever you want to do here. But no, I, I really mean it, man. It sucks to be on the beach. Uh, it's a shame you got put on the beach. It's a shame that a time slot that you and I both loved dearly essentially vanished. I mean, Sports Phone is no more. I was a caretaker of that show. You were a great caretaker of that show. And the old school broadcaster in me like mourns the death of a very important piece of my career. Yeah, I mean, is it a nude beach that I'm on? I hope because so. Because if it is, I'm cool with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm all about that. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, I, 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 I don't. I don't miss the, the the watching the all the videos, the HR videos, and clicking on stuff, and that th everybody's really concerned about when in the corporate world. But I, I really miss talking to fans every night. Like, uh, I think I made a connection with a lot of people. Um, that was my favorite part about that show the first time. When I came back the second time, eleven years later, everyone was telling me that that people don't call radio shows anymore. Nobody takes calls, and I'm like, no, I'm going to bring that back. Yeah, like, and. and over the, the two years or year and a half plus that I was at KMBR, um, I took great pride in the fact that like it was our show and I talked to the people and I listened to it. Because I think Sports Talk Radio is about like listening what the fans have to say and getting keeping a finger on the pulse with fans. I mean, the biggest reason, Damon, I, I moved back to Washington, D.C. when I was a broadcaster for the Nationals is I wanted to be a part of the fan base. I wanted to feel what they were feeling. Most um, most broadcasters, not with the Giants, they're they're all local. But most broadcasters in most cities, you know, fly in, rent a place for six months, and then right. they have a home base. Um, and I wanted to live there year round and feel what uh, at the time Redskins fans were feeling, or Capitals fans, um, or Wizards fans, and, and and have beers with like Harry Carey. Right, like you I, embrace the community. Yeah, I would go out every night with fans after the game, and they would tell me what they thought about the Nationals and this and that, and you know, so. In that sense, like I'd love to be a part of the people. I, I love to, I'm very social. And the part of the show that I miss right now the most is is not all the corporate stuff and, and and not preparing for the show and who's coming on as a guest. Like, you know, that's that can get really daunting uh when when you're doing it all by yourself and you don't have a partner. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I do miss is talking to the fans. So I've been really active on Twitter or X or whatever the hell you call it right now. Um and yeah, I miss the people that 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 I I built a little community every night and we would talk about things and we would talk about real life things, not just sports. Yeah. Well, and that's the beauty of nighttime radio. You can kind of throw the what you have to do playbook out and do kind of more what you want to do. That's the freedom that weekend and nighttime time slots offered young broadcasters or even in your case, an experienced broadcaster to be more of yourself. And I just hate that those reps aren't even out on the practice field for anyone anymore. I mean, that really hurts. That 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 hurts the next generation of broadcasters. And it's why these these media companies are basically like a snake eating its own tail. They just sure they're saving money today by getting rid of a day part, but they're actually costing themselves money in the future because the next generation of broadcaster that you're gonna have to turn to when this generation of broadcaster ages out might not be there. And it's like you know, Major League Baseball went about saving money by culling its farm system and look at how, you know, what, how rough it is to be a rookie in Major League Baseball with less minor league development places to to go and 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 get the, ne the, the necessary reps you need to be good at such a, a big and public level. Yeah, the big leagues is a tough place to learn how to play baseball. And we're seeing a lot right. now. Like, guys are making mistakes that we made in a ball in front of 300 people and they're doing it in front of 40,000 people with every right. game being telecast. I think it's fascinating, man, the connection that you made in San Francisco. And we were just talking about this before we clicked Let's Go and Talk today. And by the way, people are uh, are very excited that you're in here. We got people in the chat already saying, like, look, 
FP, solid dude, great host. I would agree. I would absolutely agree there. FP, right there, a comedian oh. <laughs> with tales from the locker room. I will follow him wherever he winds up. Look, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on today was to let everyone know that this summer you're going to be back all over KNBR because you're still part of the Giants broadcasting crew. Yes, I'm going to be doing games. I don't know how many or in what capacity, but uh, I was told I'm going to do some games, and you know that, that's my true passion. When I'm a, whatever's going on in my life, when I walk through the doors of Oracle Park or any major league field, I, it's Disneyland for me. And totally. I just turn into a little kid, and even family members that are with me, like you were so bummed today earlier, and look at you now, you're just bouncing around, shaking hands, kissing babies. I wouldn't know what to do, Damon, if I can't go to a big league park, like. You, you can take the radio show away from me, great. But I'm a baseball player and, right. and a baseball broadcaster and a major league broadcaster. And I just hope that that uh, I can't thank the Giants enough, first of all, for including me and bring me back into the fold. That forever Giant thing is a real thing. Like they've always treated me like like Barry Bonds. It, it, and and you think that, that that's that that's the one thing when the, we'll get to the free agent thing. That the one thing if you play one year for the Giants, ten year for the Giants. Everyone kind of makes fun of that forever giant thing. It's a real thing. Like they, they have always treated me like I was somebody and they still do to this day. And so the fact that I'm going to be included in a small part, big part, I don't know what it is um, in the broadcast in 2024. I mean, so that's kind of cushioned the blow as you would, you know, based on losing or being laid off at KMBR. Um, yeah, I'm a giant. I'll always be a giant. I can't wait to get back in the booth with, I don't know a little part of the greatest broadcast team ever assembled it's, it's in, in my else. opinion. And I'm not just saying that I've no, always it, thought that uh, those guys gave you my start in broadcast. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have been a major league broadcaster for 11 years in DC or part of the giants broadcast before that. If it wasn't for Dwayne Kuyper, Mike Kruko, John Miller and Dave Fleming. Well, and they're, they're generous guys. They're good guys. They really are. I mean, it would be easy to muscle the new guy kind of elbow him out of the picture and they seem to be, you know, inclusive. And and what's amazing, and I think if we went around San Francisco and we asked people this trivia question, many people would get it wrong. How many years? I'm going to ask you real quick. How many years do you think FP played for the Giants? Like, there's probably like three, four years, three, four seasons. We all know it wasn't like a really long time. It was 133 games. That's it. Damn good 130. A, a hell of 130, but it was that was it. That, nobody it. No, nobody's parlayed a mediocre career into <laughs> an afterlife in broadcasting. But it, but it really is amazing. Like, like this city and you formed a bond and a connection and maybe it was a, the great nickname of the fighting hydrants that kept everyone's mind on you after you had moved out. So you moved on from the Giants, you did a you had a cup of coffee with the Dodgers and then a cup of then what? I was a good giant as a Dodger. I hit 196, I think, in L.A., so I did my part uh, going down there. <laughs> I was like a spy. Went down there and just the mole. absolutely shit the bed in Los Angeles. It was great. That was weird. That, that, that whole dynamic down there is like everybody's so spread out geographically, like the players and the wives. Mm -hmm. Nobody hangs out in off days. Because, you know, somebody lives in Newport Beach, Manhattan Beach, Marina Del Rey, Pasadena. It's hard to get to. So in off days, you just kind of hang out. But the Giants in off days, like, we were a family, man. We had barbecues together, the wives, the kids, everybody. Uh, I remember one time Barry came to a party, and everybody's like, Barry's coming. Because he didn't usually do that stuff. Right. And he's the one that got me hooked on Porsches, damn it. Like, he drove this sweet Porsche to this party, and he's like, take it for a spin. I'm like, I've had a few beers. He's like, I don't care. So I just, like, raced around the block a few times. And um, the Giants are, are and st uh, were and still are a very close-knit group. So, um, yeah, that whole L.A. thing was a weird experience. And so... So I've always appreciated that you, you know, a lot, a lot of former athletes, they don't like to show vulnerable sides. They don't like to talk about when things went wrong. They just want to kind of live in their glory days. What was it like at the end of a major league career where you're like, oh man, I can't get this average back above 200 here. It's my, I know it's coming to an end. Did you start thinking about the next chapter before you left it? Or can you not even allow yourself to do that? No, I, I knew Damon when, when, when I was in Oakland in 2001 and we won 100. That was the final season. We were we won 102 games. I was a guy that would pick my spots and go out, but I knew the end was approaching. So that team was like Motley Crew meets baseball. And we'd go out till three in the morning, like 18 deep every night, just take over bars and win 10 to two the next day. And um, I knew- Pre-social media, by the way, yeah, you could get away with things. Pre-social uh, media. Yeah, Jason Giambi had it wired. Uh, <laughs> so- uh, I knew when I came in the clubhouse and saw the uh, the lineup card on the wall and my name was in the lineup, and I was, like, mad. 
Because I used to be pissed. I used to be pissed. Oh. What is that? That's a little frozen thing. Is that a sunspot? No. So what happens is like sometimes there's this new thing where sometimes it picks up on hand gestures. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'm Italian. I talk with my hands. It's all right. No, I I knew when I uh, was in the lineup and I was upset that the end was near because I used to get pissed off if I was in the lineup. I go pout in my locker for about 10, 15 minutes if I wasn't playing. And then I would get there and I'm in the lineup and I was like, oh shit, I'm going to play today. Like, damn it. And then I, I knew it was near, the end was near, but I didn't know what was next. Felipe Alou, who was my mentor, my life coach, and, and, and one of the biggest influences in my life ever, that gave me my shot at the big league, said I'd be a big, good big league manager someday. And then Dusty told me I'd be a great big league manager someday. Art Howe pulled me aside at Jason Giambi's wedding and said, you'd be a great big league manager. Cause you know why they told you that? Because right. you can communicate with people. You talk to people, man. Yeah, and I like to win. I like to beat your ass any way I can, too. Uh, and, and that's my, I, I do miss winning. Um so I, th- I thought, okay, well, I called Brian Sabian and said I'll be a minor league coach, whatever. And so he said, we don't have any managerial jobs, but go be the hitting coach in San Jose. And that was really hard, you know, getting back on the buses right out of retirement, um, making $30,000 a year, which I take right now, by the way, uh, making $30,000 a year. Start a uh, YouTube channel. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, about, that's about the going rate these days. No, so I, I did the minor league coaching thing and it just wasn't, I mean, it was just different. And I wanted to manage. I didn't want to be a hitting coach. I want to manage. Uh and that didn't work out, so I called Dwayne, uh, and I said, I want to be a broadcaster. Everybody told me I was a broadcast journalism major in college. And he got me a, a gig at KNBR as a fill-in, and uh, I talked to Bob Agnew. And, um, yeah, and, and then the broadcasting thing took over, and I fell in love with it. Like, I fell in love um, with the adrenaline, uh, with being able to communicate and articulate um, your thoughts in a way that people can understand them. I mean, you're not talking down to them, you're talking to them. And my broadcasts uh, in D.C. were mostly – educational. I would tell you why things happen and try to teach the fans about baseball without like talking down to them and in a way that that was well received apparently. So I don't know. I, I got into the broadcasting thing, but I wasn't I wasn't really thinking about what next what's next, Damon. And here's the thing. I really I really bonded with veterans in DC and I did a lot of work with PTSD veterans that served our country. Um and, and the thing where we bonded was and I was talking to like a Marine at a party one night that was in charge of this. It's called Warrior Path. It's it's non-inclusive drug um, rehabilitation for guys that are suicidal. And 22 veterans kill themselves every day in our country. And what happens, Damon, is we train all our lives, veterans, athletes, to do one thing. And we train to hit a baseball, to throw a baseball, to catch a baseball. And that's all we do, seven, eight, ten hours a day. And we are, we're part of a tribe, and we have value to you as my teammate. Mm-hmm. And then we do this crazy thing in front of 40,000 people every night, and it's an adrenaline rush. And you're jogging around the bases, and they're chanting your name. And and then that's all taken away. Gone. Gone. And so how do I be a father? How do I be uh, a partner? How, it, 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 life never prepares you for that. And then you miss that. Yeah. So, like— these guys go through that stuff and it's just like, wow. So we had that in common. Like they're, they're firing off missiles and like $5 million missiles and they're saving their buddies' lives. And next thing you know, be a dad. Right. Yeah. Be a husband, be a wife. Yeah. Be a mother. Like they, 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 they trained all their lives for one thing. So the transition is really tough. And i I was lost for a minute, like baseball coach, bro, I didn't know what I was doing. So I'm super blessed to have found another passion and all the players like in DC is like, dude, your afterlife is amazing. They call it the afterlife. Like right. When, when you're done playing. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I've been blessed. But when you're playing, if you start thinking about the R word, the retirement word before you're done, you lose that edge. And once you lose that edge and you start thinking about what's next, yeah, I, yeah, I just right. Your the, mind's already somewhere else. I wasn't the same player after that. It's it's amazing the psychological element to sports, and you know, an awful lot of psychological. Uh, conversation is happening around the whole Draymond Green suspension right now. And, you know, it, to me, what's amazing about this Draymond Green suspension, and, and I think that, you know, any attempt to, to try to label him is like, well, he really needs help. There must be something wrong. I mean, I don't know. You can go back to the glory halcyon days of the Warriors, and he was still kind of a flaming asshole. And he's just, that's who he is. He's a little bit of an asshole. He's a little bit of a bully, and it takes one to know one. And I can identify with that a little bit. There's a little, that you know, I, I can see how Draymond Draymond goes about thinking like there's a rule book for all of you and there's a rule book for me and fuck you and I earned it and that's the beauty of being me and you all wish you were Draymond like I that's just who he is what the NBA just told the Warriors is you can't you can't put a leash on your own dog so we're gonna do it for you that's what, this indefinite suspension for Draymond Green 
is more of a condemnation of how the Warriors have handled it than I think of Draymond Green himself. Yeah, I think when we listen to the commissioner talk, like he's talking about like we didn't want to put a number on it, so everyone's fixated on the number. It should have been more. It should have been less. That we want to get him better. There's something going on there. I mean, uh, I don't know what, and it's not for me to say what, but it's weird. Like when you're on the inside as an athlete, you're like, well, that guy's an alcoholic. That guy's cheating on his wife. This guy's doing drugs. And there's so many things that you see behind closed doors right. of issues that guys have. We used to joke on the bench, like if they knew what was going on right now, nobody would watch us because we're all a mess. <laughs> right. Like we're all a mess. So like, I don't know what he's going on. He's got something going on. There, there, there's something going on, whether he's just bored with winning or there could be some family. But it's always been something. I mean, from from stepping on Sabonis' chest to kicking LeBron in the nuts to kicking Steven Adam in the nuts to hitting Jordan Poole in practice. Like, there's enough seasons of something's wrong with malcontent Draymond to the point where it, it's him. It's not, it's not like he's getting triggered. It's just who he is. He thinks that he can do... He thinks there's a rule book that's for everyone, and then he's got his own rule book, and it fits him, and he doesn't have to change his rules. And I don't know. Like, there, I have no sympathy for the guy. I have I, no sympathy for him at all. I don't either. And what it is, it's it's selfish to me. Yeah. So if if you think that my agenda on getting double technicals because I'm upset with calls and getting thrown out of the game is more important than us winning— then that's a problem. If you think me choking a guy or stepping on a guy or taking a swing at a guy— is more important than us winning, that's a problem. It's like from a player standpoint, that's selfish because you can't help me in the locker room. You can't help me when you're suspended for right. however long. You can't help me win. So if you're a player in baseball, let's do the baseball thing, and you're one of our best hitters and it's the fourth inning and you don't like a strike three call and you get thrown out of the game and your turn comes up in the seventh and the ninth in a one run game and you're our best hitter and you're in the clubhouse drinking a beer, like, to me, that's selfish. You have to be able to control your emotions. Yeah. And still play with passion and fire. Right. But control your emotions and stay in the game because you can't help me. So when you have a selfish agenda to do whatever because you can't control yourself, then as a teammate, I'm looking at him differently today or even this year. Like, he derailed last year by punching a teammate. No championship season ever started with one teammate punching another. I've said this a million times. Like, the, you know, in the course of a season, do you get pissed? And, you know, if we're teammates and it's like we've been together for four months and you're on my nerves and it's just I'm sick of your act. Yeah, I've seen right. fights in the dugout in the off, clubhouse. Sure. But never every, in spring training, everybody's like, hey, what's up, dude? Right, good to good see to you. Good to see you, man. <laughs> like, you were an asshole last year, but, like, I'll give you a chance. And, and, and to see that out of the gate after winning a championship. So he derailed last year. He's derailing this year. To me, like, there's something going on behind the scenes. Not for me to sit here and speculate. But that's selfish. And he's being selfish yeah. for whatever reasons. I don't know what he's going, got on, going on in his personal life. But, like, part of being a professional is checking all that at the door. Like I said right. earlier. Like, when I walk through a, the doors of a ballpark, I'm the happiest guy in the world. When I walk through, when I walk into the arena and I walk in a locker room with my bros, like, I'm the happiest guy in the world. And you leave all that stuff behind. And if it's bleeding onto the court, his personal life, whatever he's got going on, it's just selfish. It's, it's just, it's the most selfish behavior you have. It's not about like dunking and look at me and posing or flipping a bat in the air. That's not selfish. That's celebrating. Selfish is not being available for your bros. To me, th you know, like no one's been able to curtail or reel in Draymond. And I don't know if they've, uh, they, they pulled like every lever. This is the one thing that I would do if it were up to me, like Damon, go correct Draymond Green. You have, you have 15 minutes to talk to Draymond Green. This has got to be a really good, good conversation in 15 minutes. We want results at the end of it. What are you going to go in and say to him? I can't help you unless you want to be helped. There's an I element of that. Say, and right. I'll turn around and walk. I, I would, I, well, I would walk in there and I would say to him, you say you love Steph Curry. You are disrespecting Steph Curry. Everything you do is a detriment to how Steph Curry's career ends. You used to be a great teammate. You're now a shitty teammate of Steph Curry. Don't you owe Steph Curry more than that? Steph Curry's put money in your pocket, roof over your head, and rings on your fingers. Do better for your one of the greatest of all time teammates and be a better teammate to Steph Curry. And I think that might get his attention because he's got no respect for Steve Kerr. He's got no, if Bob Myers was the only guy that he really would listen to, well, that guy's not in the room anymore, which means he's not listening to anybody. I would tell him you're tainting your legacy. Yeah. That people are going to remember you, remember you for all the stuff you've done 
and got suspended for and not for winning four rings. And right. more importantly, who cares what people think? Your peers, yeah. your teammates. Like everybody in the league sitting there. We're all gossipy. They're sitting there going, you see what Draymond right. did? Nobody likes you, dude. It's not, it's not about being liked. Like I was never liked as a player uh, from my opponents. And I would be pissed if my opponents liked me because I was out there to beat your ass and right. not make friends. Like I'm not trying to be your Instagram buddy or your Facebook friend. Right. I'm trying to beat your ass and win. So I don't care if people like me. If I'm Draymond, I don't give a shit if people like me. But do they respect me? And he's losing respect. And he's tainting his legacy, most importantly from an athlete standpoint, from his peers. And his teammates, they're remembering him for all the stuff we're talking about, not the four rings. Right. The four rings are in the background now. The forefront is what he's doing as an athlete and it, 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 among, in the opinion amongst his peers. That to me and the coaches and the people that are directly involved with the NBA are looking at him differently. And now this is, this is garnering more attention than his accomplishments and his achievements. By the way, senior softball games who's clearly from mexico uh says hopefully this is a precursor of fp's own show and you know what it's gonna be this is one of the another reasons why i wanted fp to come on in because there will be an fp channel it's coming oh yeah pat mcafee better look the f out because i'm coming in <laughs> i'm coming in hot are you gonna wear a uh a wife beater and and show off the shoulders every day no i do i got guns i still work out yeah. I you do. look like it. I, yeah. I do. Yeah. Uh, I, there was a solid man I, when I, I did this. F, there was a solid man it's there. FP in a pod. If you want to subscribe. On FP in a pod. Are, yeah. there, is, are there any videos even up yet, or is no. just no? Just subscribe. I, I just did the it's channel coming. yesterday. FP in a pod. I like that. I see where you're going with it. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we always stop for super chats. Look at this. Somebody just handed us ten dollars to say FP. Let's fucking go. LFG, baby. Sons of Johnny LeMaster. There's a, there's an old school Giant fan right there. They're great Giants he, fans. Th yeah, they listen to my show on a flight to Japan. Nice. And they were tweeting at me or whatever you call it now. Well, we're huge in Japan. I'm going to tell you that right now. We've got at least uh, five people in Japan watching. Uh, this is uh, Danny saying, thanks for bringing FP on the show. I was a big fan of his nighttime show, both back in 2010 and in the past year. He did an awesome job covering the Niners playoff run this season. What do you think of the Niners this season, man? Isn't that a, it's a, it's a hell of a run that they're on right now. They're about as, you know, there, there's no such thing as an easy Super Bowl. But if they stay healthy, they have the best argument to make to get to the Super Bowl, I think maybe in the NFL. Dude, the best thing about the Niners season, they started like reading their press and believing the headlines and, and they just got whacked or was upside the head because uh, sports will humble you, right? Yeah. When you think you got it and you got it figured out, it'll, 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 it'll definitely humble you. And they got humbled by that, that little streak where they lost three in a row. But I'm a huge Brock Purdy guy because it resonates with me in a big way. Like everybody told me I was too small, too slow, too short, couldn't do it. Um, you know, you're a 20th round pick, you signed for a thousand dollars. I was way below Mr. Irrelevant. Like if you look at where I was in the 1989 draft at the 20th round by the Expos, right. I was way below 262. You were Mr. Lucky to be here. <laughs> uh, and I just knew if I got my foot in the door, I would make it. I said, just give me a chance. So I signed for a thousand dollars. So it, it, it resonates with me because Initially, he didn't have a he didn't have a chance to have a bad day. Mm -hmm. If you're a first round pick, you got lots of chances to have lots of bad days because there's money invested in you, and they're they're not going to give up on the investment because you have potential. But when you're Mister Irrelevant or a low round pick, you get your day in the sun. You got to shine. So if he'd have thrown like three picks his first game or just crap the bed initially, right? You know he had he had to perform like on the side of a cliff because it was going to go one way or another. Well, and there's something too about the guy who's not on Alabama. He's not playing on a team with nine other future first round draft picks on my own team. He's coming from Iowa state, which means he is the rising tide, which makes all boats in the Harbor lift. And there's something to be said for the underestimated guy from the smaller school who earned his right to be there more than the five-star recruit who got lavishly set up to play with all these other five stars. And most of these games come easy. And there's just something about that good old fashioned work ethic of a kid who's going to grind. And you can just tell he was, his father was a grinder. He was a grinder. And I just, I, I it's an incredible story. It's an incredible story and why people now in sports media spend show after show trying to take things away from him other than say, what we're watching is the most special story we've seen in this league since Kurt Warner came out of nowhere with the St. Louis Rams. I just don't understand it. We live in a world where people just want to be combative and tear things down. And that was reflected in just you basically the other day tweeting, 
gee, sure is beautiful in San Francisco. Great to see an awful lot of people out here doing all this holiday shopping. And then someone's like, no, San Francisco sucks, FP. You're wrong about the city that you live in and you're walking in. And I'm going to tweet you from my home in Mississippi to tell you how lousy San Francisco really is. Yeah, people that don't live here. Yeah. I I, 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 da- I I stuck my toe in the political water the other day on Twitter. I'm like, oh, no. Don't do I that. I hate politics. I was just trying to express my love for the city. But back to Brock Purdy, he's got to keep that chip on his shoulder forever. Yeah. There's two kinds of people in this world. People, they, they tell you you can't do it. You're like, you're right. I suck. And there's people that are like, screw you. I'm going to show you wrong. And he's got to keep that F you mentality that I'm going to show you wrong. So people that keep criticizing him, like I applaud it, please, please keep criticizing Brock Purdy. Because as soon as he starts driving like the Lamborghini and he gets the big contract and he's got the mansion and the and the kids and the wife, what happens as an athlete, you start to have everything and you become complacent. You have like two or three rings. You've won World Series. You've won the Super Bowl. You have all the money. Uh, you have a beautiful wife. You have beautiful kids. You have a beautiful house. You have you have everything. Right. It was a Marvin Hagler, I think, who said it's hard to get up and do your road work when you're sleeping in ten thousand thread count sheets. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So it, you got to stay hungry, and that, that's going to be the evolution of this whole thing. Keep that chi- chip on your shoulder, bro. Like, keep telling. I used to love when people used to tell me those things because that was like that was fuel in my gas tank. Or now mm-hmm. I have an electric car. That was the that was the plug in the electricity. It was I the charge like, in your <laughs> electric car. <I> just, <laughs> It's all right. I'm it's manly to have an electric car. I don't know about that. <laughs> I'd rather have an electric car than an electric razor. Yeah, no. You got to shave with a real razor. Don't have You're not shaving much these days. <laughs> it's good to be out of work. Anyway, look, uh, hey, speaking of uh, uh, giving love to work, we got to, FP, you know this, is a longtime radio guy. You got to stop and you got to give love to the sponsors. And first of all, my man, Ike, when's the last time you had an Ike sandwich? I don't know, but I could go for one right now. Uh, we can get one. We'll, we'll get one ordered a little bit later on. Let's go. Ike's, here he is. This is Ike. He can join us right in the middle of the show. This is our man right here. This is a guy serving up sandwiches in love all over San Francisco. That's a little flavor saver right there. Saver right Isn't that? There. Yeah. Isn't that great? Do my kids came in here. They're like, oh, my God, we got a friend to play with. And so they, they I got a, my, my two-year-old, Ozzy, humps everything. He's a humper, and he's humped that. Um, anyway, uh, we, we want to thank Ikes. We want to thank Dr. Paul Hughes. He gave me the Kobe Bryant knees. I had bone-on-bone bone FP, a bad arthritis, like totally eligible for uh, knee replacement surgery. He took fat, and I've got an ample amount of that. He took fat from my love handle, spun it around in a centrifuge, stuck it into my knee, and my knee— I'm 48. My knee feels 28. That's awesome. Avoiding surgery with Dr. Paul Hughes. And uh, we'll also let you know if you want to make any plays this weekend. It is mybookie.ag. Use promo code Damon when you sign up and you get 50% deposit match up to $1,000. And that is how you take care of the sponsors, FP. It's just like the radio, except we now don't have to go to break. We can just keep talking. That's and awesome. That's the beauty of this, man. You just get to come on in, let it all out, talk about whatever you want to talk about. Nobody interrupts you. You are going to... When you start your YouTube channel, you are going to feel like you can finally spread your wings. You're going to love it. I I know you well enough (laughs) to know that you are going to love this. You are going to really enjoy the bond that you make with your audience, which is something you've always enjoyed. The connection that you get to make on YouTube is incredibly intimate compared to the connection that you make with people on the radio. You're going to love it. You're going to dominate this space when you come into it, man. There's no doubt in my mind. That's awesome. It, you just, I, I'm still, your two year old's a humper, still like going around. In my yeah, head. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good thing he's not here right now. I mean, I can relate. <laughs> good for him. <laughs> that kid fucks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, look, it's, it's, it's so good to have you here. I wanted to, I, I reached out to you right away because, you know, you're talking all about, you know, confidence and, and believing in yourself. And no matter how good you think you are at something, when it's taken from you, you feel incomplete. You feel incomplete. And you're the kind of guy who needs a microphone at the end of the night. You have things to say. You need to share them. And you're going to have a new place to do that real soon. FP in a pod. Go ahead. Sign up and subscribe right now. FP in a podcast. FP in a podcast? FP in a pod. FP in a pod. F-P-I-N-A-P-O-D. There you go. There you go. Um, 
Let's go. We got a lot of questions in here for you. People want to talk. That's people cool. people want to talk I to FP. By, by the way, there's an Expos logo that I've never seen in here before. Yes. TP Joseph is all over this show today because FP is here. What was it like being a Montreal Expo? That 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 must have been must have felt like you had your own little outpost that was part of Major League Baseball, but very much like your own little planet to live on. Montreal is an awesome town, an awesome town that a lot of Americans don't understand how great of a town Montreal is. Very good food, very good nightlife, beautiful women. Uh, Montreal is a hell of a town. It, it, there should still be baseball in Montreal. Yes, there should. 100%. And great unis. Great. The Expos unis were awesome. They were the clown. Well, I had the pinstripes, but before that was the clown unis, and they were amazing with the clown hats. That city's... I used to tell rookies... After I was there for a while, like, be careful, the city will, you'll be back in AAA in a minute if you have no self-discipline. Because it's open till 4 or 5 a.m. every night. The bars are vibrant. The nightlife is crazy. And this was in the 90s. I, don't, I haven't been back in a while. Um, but it was a cool place to uh, break into the big leagues because it, it didn't have, like, 30 beat writers in your locker like the Yankees or the Mets do. Right. Um, but the most important part was because of the lack of free agent signings, when I got called up and you looked around the locker room, these were all my friends and guys that I came up in the minor leagues uh, together with. So it was a really tight-knit group, right? Because you come up together, they they develop their minor leagues. They were ranked number one by Baseball America for years in the talent in their minor league system because they drafted, they developed. Um, and those guys would all go somewhere else when it was time to pay them. But like when I got called up, I would say of the 25 guys in the locker room, I knew 20 of them and they were all my friends. So it, it was an easy transition for me even though I was facing Greg Maddox and Tom Glavin and John Smoltz all of a sudden, that I was with all my buddies. It wasn't like I walked into a clubhouse and, ooh, that's so-and-so. Like when I signed with the Giants the first day in Scottsdale, I'm like, oh, there's Barry Bonds and that's Jeff Kent. And, oh, my God, like th this is the big leagues. But before, it was just my friends. I was playing with my friends in a small market in front of small crowds. Um, but Expos fans are great fans in the sense that they knew what you were hitting. They knew how the team was playing. They just only had a couple of months of summer and they didn't want to drive way outside the city to Olympic Stadium and sit indoors for a game. And they were pissed because they lost, you know, Jeff Facero and, and Pedro Martinez and Larry Walker and Marquise Grissom and Moises Alou. And you lose your favorite players every year. Right. They were the A's before the A's. Right. And they were the farm system for the rest of the big leagues. Um, but if they And in their one year that they were putting it together was the strike. Yeah. Yeah. And the, yeah, they, they were, I don't on pace to win a hundred and something games, so... They were awesome. Larry Walker. Yeah, that was a good team. That was a really good, was team. A good team. By the way, uh, Sporticus, longtime sports phone caller. FP's good for ball. Keep being you, man. Oh, Chef A just sitting out here, a little jingle jangle for four ninety nine. Thank you. You always got to thank the super chatters, FP. You got to learn that right away. Mean? So super chatter means somebody has come in and like, Bought a little goofy sticker that doesn't show up over on this end or something. But for four ninety nine, it's just like someone's throwing a little tip across the oh, bar. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and F, uh, Chef A is an incredible chef. She makes great brittle, cool as hell, and um, just a, just an awesome part of this little community that we built over here. It's 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 an honest to god connection. We've had a couple of meetups. We've gotten together at Victory Hall. People come out and they want to support you, and it's it's really really cool. And it makes you realize quickly that. You know, the channel might have been theirs, but the show was always yours. Now the channel and the show are both yours, and people really want to support it. Knowing that they're supporting you means they're supporting you, not a, a corporation above you or an entity above you. And people really, really get into it. And people are going to want to come and and be a part of the inside baseball stories that, you know, I know you're going to be sharing and your experience dealing with the highs and lows of being a professional athlete. Like there's a whole, there's a whole universe of talking points that as a former ball player, you can explore that a guy like me could never even broach. I mean, you really get to bring something unique to the party. And I just think that it's, this is going to be a great space for you. And it might not feel like it today, this summer, but losing night times at KNBR is going to give you so much more. I really believe that. That's oh, cool. I know it. I'm very optimistic about the future, whatever whatever that holds. And I'm kind of letting the universe come to me. And I've always been, you know, the guy that like goes after things mm -hmm. and breaks up the double play and runs over the catcher. And like, I want to know what's next. But like, I'm just, I'm, I'm just chill. Like at this point in my career, at my age and what I've accomplished, I know that I can offer a lot to anyone. So I'm just kind of sitting back. And I, and, and, and I'm not to sound cocky because, you know, I'm, I'm very humble. Like I, I, 
I know that I've been doing this long enough where I'm doing something right. Yeah. Because because of the people and, and the feedback. What's amazing? I, I again, I didn't realize it. I didn't. Re- you were. You were doing nationals color commentary for 11 years. Yeah. That's a long time. That's a really, really long time. And I just think that you're so well positioned with the Giants broadcasting team. And you can tell right now that they're starting to consider what could be the end of a generationally significant broadcast crew. And I just think that you're standing in the right place at the right time. And this is all... I don't know about 2024, but by 2028, I think you're going to be grinning ear to ear. I really do. I, I have zero agenda as far as that goes because I owe my whole career to those guys. Yeah. And I hope they go forever. Yeah. Like I, people ask me, like, did you come home to broadcast for the Giants? No, I came home to be with my family. Um, and I was lucky enough to get a job uh, to facilitate that. But I, I, I don't have any agenda with the Giants as far as being a broadcaster. I love those guys like family at this point. The first guy I called walking on the Embarcadero to my house was Dwayne uh, when I got laid off. And so it just, yeah, like whenever that happens, if it happens, great. But that's that's not on my that's not on my radar at all. Well, again, it's because you're a good guy. You know, you're not you, you you're you're not trying to take anyone's job or anything like that. But we all know how sports works. And veterans give away to a new class all the time. And it works like that in the broadcasting booth as well. And, you know, every, I mean, Crook and Kipe are, it's like summertime. It's, they are summertime, Crook and Kipe. When the, I know it's summer when they're on my TV, when they're on my radio. They are so ingrained in this town. And if, they, if one goes to the Hall of Fame, the, the, they both got to go together. That's got to be a package deal. It's got to be a package deal. Yeah, we were hoping they would tie for the Ford C. Frick Award uh, this year. <laughs> they didn't. Um, Joe Castigliano, uh, yeah, uh, the he, Red Sox, he, he does he, very deserving. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that's a, that's a, I mean, I, I don't, wouldn't consider myself part of that fraternity at the moment, but that's a cool fraternity to be a part of, to be a major league broadcaster and Dwayne, especially, and Mike have imparted in, in, the wisdom in me and the respect for the position. Like they didn't take me under their wing till they knew I was serious about it. And when I started doing my prep work and my homework and I wanted to be that more than anything, and I took that 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 role very seriously because we're we're the voice of the summer to people. We're a conduit of the game to your living room every night and your dinner table every night with your family. And yeah, to like do that for a living and have that honor was like that's the Blue Angel job, man. In broadcasting, it is. You're traveling with a team. You're on the charter. You're staying at Four Seasons. The lifestyle is amazing. You're in a different city every day. But more importantly, you're around the game, you're around the players. They keep you young. Yeah. And and the guys, for the most part, I'm sure I didn't keep everyone happy, but the families, the moms, the dads, the wives, the kids, the aunts, the uncles, they all they all came up to me and said, we love you. Um, every night, it was flattering. Um, but but the thing I took a lot of pride in is, is I remembered, I tried to remember how hard the game was every night. And, you know, and respect the fact that it's, it, you know, they're not perfect. But I would call things out if you didn't hustle, like in in my in my areas. If you weren't playing hard, right? The things that you can control. Yeah, the things you can control. And then if they did something silly, I would explain maybe what their mindset was and what they were thinking. And I think I think a lot of the guys that I'm still friends with from the Nationals over the years, they still text me, hey, like wondered how I'm doing, and vice versa. As someone who has lived the life of a broadcaster, who has lived the life of a major leaguer, and then has, knows how fans think because you talk to them for so many years. What do you think is the number one misunderstanding fans project on the sport of baseball or baseball players? What's the one the one element like like Draymond would always say, you know, you you guys just don't know. I like you you don't know the sport that you're covering. And I always wanted to say, well, well, what do you think we should know? Like tell like this is a chance for you to educate us, and there's absolutely an education to be had. Draymond knows more about basketball than I could ever even pretend to know, even though I went to Indiana, which we all know is a greater basketball tradition than Michigan State could ever be. But it's it, it's 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 the truth. Being a player separates you from the normals, from the talk about it. It's the actual have done it. I've always said that people think that the worst player on their team is tantamount to the worst coworker they have at their insurance company. No. The worst salesperson at your insurance company is just probably a bad employee, where the worst player on a Major League Baseball team 
is one of the single most highly skilled individuals in the world in the smallest one percentage of one half of percentage of talent that the sport could ever produce. The guy who took an 0 for 4 and grounded into four double plays is so fucking good at what he does for a living that you couldn't even fathom how good it is, how good you have to be to be a bad major leaguer. I mean, I, this is why I always put it. He has a street named after him in his hometown. And when you drive into that hometown, it says home of so-and-so, Major League Baseball player. So, I mean, yeah, it, it's not easy to get there. The one thing I would say is about fans and what, what and knowing fans know, like this is a smart fan base. And I was part of a really intelligent fan base in, on the East Coast too. And the things that, that we're frustrated with, when you talk to players, they're frustrated with the same things. So like everybody last year that was like saying this, this, and this about getting pinch hit for and what are they doing and the openers and the, the players felt the same way. Right. Like, so what I found out through the years of being connected away from the game is two things. Number one, you you didn't have had to play the game of baseball to teach me about baseball. When I first started in broadcasting, I'm like, what do you know, Damon Bruce? You never played. Right. Like, I had that chip on my shoulder. And now... I'm learning things about At least baseball. you earn the chip, you know? <laughs> yeah, but no, that, that's silly because I've opened my mind to learning things. People that have never played the game or, or I always say peed in a shower um, are teaching me things about baseball. We've all peed in showers. No, I mean, like in a, in a major league shower. <laughs> like, that, that, uh, that know things about baseball that I never thought about and they make me think. So in that regard, like what you were hearing from Giants fans this year, it, the players are thinking the same thing. What I used to hear from Nationals fans at bars – I would say the players are thinking the same thing. I wouldn't be, you know, tell them what players thinking what because then I'm crossing lines. But every every concern Giants have had they had, fans have this year, there's people there that live it. Mm -hmm. They know it. They breathe it. We just tune in for three hours every night. It's their job. It's their livelihood. They live and die with every loss. They live and die with every offer. They live and die with every per like uh, six inning, five runs. Your ER. They, that's their life and wins and losses as coaches. So. Whatever we're feeling, they're feeling. Whatever we're frustrated with, they're frustrated with. So I, I don't think there's like a disconnect between being a player and being a fan. Because when you're part of an intelligent fan base like this, or the one I was associated with back east, like they have a finger on the pulse. Like all the stuff I read on Twitter, every once in a while you're like, well, that's, you know, you're way out there on that. But it's things that I've heard and it's, it's concerns that guys have had. And not to get specific, but I, yeah, that there's really, what you're thinking is what got, that we used to think. We just can't say it publicly. Okay. Like, I can't just say, like, that's bullshit that I got pinch hit for in the fourth inning tonight after hitting a home run last time up. Right. That's bullshit that you told me I was going to be an opener, or you told me I was going to be a starter, and now I'm an opener. Right. You, uh, and now I'm a reliever, but you sign, I sign. That's, like, in, and there was a lot of instances back east where guys would come up to me and vent. And they just can't. It's just a bad look if you go to the media with that, and it's gonna it's gonna hinder your job opportunities moving forward. So they say all the right things, but meanwhile they're thinking just like we're thinking. They're gossiping on the back of the plane. They're at the bar thinking the same things. Like no matter what the situation, no matter what the team, if you have an intelligent fan base, ninety percent of what you're thinking we're thinking. You know what the biggest problem with the opener? Because I totally understand it from a baseball strategy standpoint. I really do like the the Tampa Bay Rays in a moment of their their you know their, their development and their embracing of sabermetrics and not wanting a guy to get three shots at a lineup or the other way around. I should I guess I should say you don't want your your hitters taking three at bats against any one pitcher and in a team that is incredibly budget conscious like the Rays were. Like I get why it fit for them. It bothers me when it happens with the Giants though because to me as just a baseball fan, you tell me, hey, I got us a couple tickets to tonight's game. You want to go? My very first question has always been, who's pitching? And if you can't even really answer who's pitching, it hurts the brand. It hurts baseball as a sport. It hurts fan interest. And things that hurt fan interest are officially bad for the sport. I don't care how good it is for that night's strategy. That's my problem with the opener. I get it conceptually, but it works against people falling in love with baseball and there needs to be romance attached to this game for it to work. Yeah, and you want to do whatever you can do to put yourself in a situation to win every night. But I think what we're losing in baseball is realizing that there's people inside the uniforms mm -hmm. and they're human beings. And how I'm feeling about myself with confidence levels and how I'm contributing to the success 
of the bowl club is huge. And me hitting in the seventh or eighth or ninth inning in the championship innings, as I call them, and coming through or failing, but having that opportunity to help my team in the late innings is huge. Me standing on the mound for the last out and having a complete game, what that does for my psyche, what it does for my teammates, what it does for our confidence level as a bunch. But if you're constantly getting pinch hit for, or you're constantly getting pulled out of the game, or you're worried about matchups more than the person in the uniform and the human being, you're going to lose a lot of players. You're going to lose. You're going to lose that the edge that we talked about. Because that f you, I want to have that f you in me in the eighth inning. Look you in the eye and hit a line drive right past your ear. Two run score. I'm standing on first base and the crowd's going crazy. But if I'm in the on deck circle and I get pulled back because the math says that I got a better chance with this guy hitting. No matter no matter how you sell it, it's still telling me that you're better than I am, and you got a better chance to win the game. Than right. Me. We're, I'll tell or, you. Where. Or as a pitcher, you're better than me. You have a better chance of getting that guy out than I do. So go sit down. I don't care what the math says. Like, and I think we're on the right track as a Giants organization with Bob Melvin and Pat Burrell and and guys that have worn the uniform that and Matty Williams and and Mark Hallberg and guys that that know the the privilege and what it means to be a giant and to wear that uniform. And when you start bringing guys from too many other places that don't realize the significance in the history of the organization and what it means to wear the orange and black, to me, if I'm, if you're a free agent and I'm part of the interview process, I'm, I'm asking you first and foremost, do you want to be a giant? Not how many years, not how much money, not what do you think about us? Do you want to be a giant? I want, I want people I want players and coaches that want to be a San Francisco Giant. Not not that that want to Why play. are there so few answering yes to that question these days? Cuz I know that this is something that I'm sure everyone is talking about on Sports Talk Radio today. Buster Posey, and this was eliminated in an Andrew Baggerly column, basically said, you know, the city of San Francisco used to be a real selling point, and right now it could be a little bit of a hindrance for free agents. I also think that that's a very convenient issue to duck behind for a team that hasn't been able to land a free agent going back way too many years, going way back before the current over-exaggerated problems of San Francisco became talking points. Um, uh, it, like to me, like, like even if he believes it, he shouldn't have said it out loud, but why, why don't free agents come to San Francisco? You know, I'm glad Buster said what he said. It's the elephant in the room, say it, address it, and then move forward. Like what he said is right. It, when 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 I sign a contract somewhere as a free agent, my wife and my kids are the boss. Like, sure. If, if there's two deals on there, my wife's going to say, "Well, you know, what's it like there? What's it like here?" Like the families have a huge say. It's not just a player. It's not fantasy league and this much money and that much money. It's like if I'm going somewhere for a long period of time, do I want to live there? Mm -hmm. And I think there's a huge misconception about the city of San Francisco and what's going on. Is a lot of it real? Yeah. Is, is a lot of it? Yeah, I, I walk it every day or I used to walk it to work every day. Right. I, I walked home from a bar at 11 o'clock last night and never felt safer in my life. So a lot of it's exaggerated. A lot of it's true. Um, I think there's perception reality, like Buster said. Right. The reality ain't great, but the perception's worse than the reality right now. Um, and I think I, I think when you talk about why free agents aren't signing with the Giants, we talk as players. Like, what's it like? What's Gabe like? Right. What's like? Well, well dude, I'm getting pinch hit for everything. Like, night. how much is it that I, I'm, I'm not starting pitcher? Like, how much is left center field, or excuse me, right center field, the Finley's Alley, the archways? How much is that twenty four foot high no, wall standing in zero. the way of them signing free agents? Zero. Maybe the weather because you like to play baseball in warm weather. It's conducive to me getting loose in my injuries right. and not feeling your knee with your love handles in it. Um, it, it, <laughs> you can't do that every day. <laughs> you can't just inject fat into your knee and be warm. Um, so yeah, maybe the weather's a part of it, but I, I, I don't know. I, I'd say I, this, no rain. Uh, I'm, uh, you, you will be sacrificing 12 to 15 degrees every single day you play, but we don't have rain outs here. Yeah. You're talking to a kid that grew up a Giants fan and that played for the Giants. It was like a fantasy camp year where I'd look down at my Jersey in center field and go, holy shit. I used to stand, I used to sit there. And rag on somebody, and now I'm standing here. I'm warming up between innings with Barry Bonds, and it hit me after a month. Like, I'm playing catch with Barry Bonds. So I'm I'm a little, I guess, biased. Sure. I mean, I, I love the Giants. I grew right. up a Giants fan. And I think, I think it's an honor to wear that uniform and to play in that ballpark. And it's a beautiful ballpark. I'll say this. 
Like the selling points are the ballpark, and there's no organization in baseball that treats you better than the Giants. Your family, my kids, they my kids still talk about it. My ex-wife still talks about it. Like I still think about my my time with the Giants, whether it was a coach in the minor leagues, whether it was a player in the big leagues, whether it was a broadcaster, they treat you better than 95%. What's the difference? As someone who's been in other places and you say, this place treated me better, what is the definitive difference in you getting treated better? Like they just treat you well. Everything's taken care of. They, they dot all the I's and cross all the T's. They take care of the families. They make sure everything's fine. How's, how's your room? How's this? Uh, I think a lot of times in professional sports, Damon, the term family is thrown around way too loosely. It's like we're family here. No, you're not. You're you don't you don't give a shit about anybody except for the money in your bank account if you're an owner. Right. And ninety five percent of or ninety percent of of pro sports franchises. But in my experiences, and this is my personal opinion, to this day from the day I played with them, they have treated me, my kids, my ex wife, like better than better. And I've been a part of a lot of organizations that say they do this, but then they don't follow through. Like there, there's some players that signed with the team that I was broadcaster for that had like 17 things that had to change with the organization before they signed the contract. As far as like families and family trips and how they travel and they just there's no expense with the Giants. They don't care about what it costs. They just want you to be happy. Like what other team goes out of their way to make sure the families are in the stands for the major league debut of this rookie. Like teams just don't do stuff like that. For example, of going above and beyond. Right. Like it's more so you fend for yourself. Right. People think it's common because they see the giants do it all the time. Do they go out of their way to find somebody and get them like, I don't know, temporary visas and fly them in to be in the stands for their kids first big league game. Or how are we going to do this logistically? Like the, the family lives on the East coast. We play at this time. They find a way to do it. And just so that's just an, like a tiny example of them going above and beyond to like treat people I- I- as well as you can be. Because you know what? In the it's the big leagues. It's supposed mm-hmm. to be like that, but it's not like that everywhere. By the way, Chef Amy coming in. I used to call on your show FP once in a while. Talked about food. I'm Chef Amy. Devastated oh, yeah. when I heard that you were let go. Can't wait for more of you. Chef Amy's awesome. Hi. There she is. There's Don saying, uh, uh, love FP. Always appreciated his positive mindset. Swing hard in case you hit it. (laughs) That's great. It's my sign off. It's a great sign off. It really, really is. Um, yeah, man, there's just an awful lot of love coming in for you here right now, man. There's no doubt about are it. Are you People making are, money? Are, yeah, yeah making we're making money, money right now. Money? We're making money. Right, we're good. making money. I'm making money. You're not making any basement? money. I'm taking this. Here, here we are. In your Wayne's World here, here we are. Welcome to Aurora. Uh, uh, from Mike Antics, welcome to Sports Talk Freedom, FP. Thanks for what you did for my A's. Oh, that was the, that was literally baseball heaven. That was going out till three in the morning every night and winning 10 to two every day and then doing it again. And the shenanigans were, I mean, I could write a book. If I wanted to make money, I just need to write a book about the 2001 Oakland A's and like name names and things. Well, Giambi, I mean, he came right. He had the, <laughs> I he, would never. Giambi had what the, the t-shirt that said hit like an all-star party, like a rock star, fuck like a porn star. Yeah. We did, we did all those. <laughs> and then more. And then more. Oh, man. That's nothing. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, oh, those, those must have been some we, we unbelievable got, days. I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell you this. Uh, apparently, you used to, used to travel to towns twice out of your division. Mm-hmm. And the A's, before I got called up, traveled to Toronto. And I won't say the player, but somebody popped off to customs on the way, leaving Toronto. Okay. And so I was. Isringhausen. I'm not going to tell you. And then we, we flew in the second time. And they had German shepherds on the tarmac. They had customs every. It looked like, I mean, they had, there was like 10 German shepherds. Landed in a war zone. Yeah. And there was custom agents all over. And they started yelling at the guy like, see what you did last time? Look at this. So I saw black guys turn white. I saw white guys turn green. It, it, back in the day when you went out the back of the plane with the stairway, the, 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 the lavatory, the, the toilet was stuffed with illegal substances where guys were like... <laughs> Stepping on the toilet and just trying to flush things down the toilet. I mean, guys were like, that team did everything that you could possibly imagine. And it was just like, they were scared. And the dogs were there and everyone was freaking out. And they just shoved it, you know, the two bathrooms on the way out. Uh And the the lid couldn't even close of all the stuff that was shoved into the toilet. Oh, my God. And then we made it. We made it through customs. And you still won 100 games. And just so you know, like, customs for pro sports teams is eyewash. Oh, yeah. It's like right this it's way. It's like, hey, come on. Yeah. Let me see. Yeah, come on. Hey, here's your passport. There's a camera. Come on. But that time. They gave it to yeah, you. Yeah, they, they were going to give us cavity searches, I feel like. It was, <laughs> like, it was that bad. It, do you have 
a, a day in your major league career that stands out more than the others? I mean, it's always hard to to live a dream and then people are like, well, what was your favorite part of that dream? Like, I really enjoyed the whole thing, <laughs> you know, but is is there a day or moment, season that really stands out to you as peak FP? Like if we can only do one year of your, we can't do your full life story. We can only use one year. What year are we using from your playing My days? rookie year, I finished fourth in rookie of the year and I just was a, Rondell White got hurt and uh, I think my second game started. What year was that? 96. So who's Todd Hollinsworth? Yeah, I was fourth. And and I had better numbers, but we were in Montreal. And nobody saw us play. Right. Our, all our games weren't on TV. Um, so my first big league game in 95 when I got called up, I got two hits. It was Fuck great. you, Todd Hollinsworth, if you're watching this right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not over that. This is my rookie year. And the second game, I, I, I hit for the cycle, but I stopped at second, and I didn't know I needed a triple. Because we were winning like 21 to 6 in Colorado against the Rockies. Right. And I was a rookie, and it was like my second or third start. And You just want to make sure you don't get beaned the next at bat. Yeah. So I like pulled up around first and did the parachute thing into second. And I look into the dugout, and everyone's on the top steps yelling at me, including Felipe, who never got mad at me my whole career. I'm like, dude, I just got my fourth hit. I drove in my fifth run. I'm four for four with five RBIs. Having a day here, having folks. Having a day, and they're yelling at me. And I literally had a stand-up triple with a turn at third, but I stopped at second. Dante Bichette was jogging after the ball was down the corner. It was a stand-up triple for the cycle. And that's probably my best day as a big leaguer, even though... Uh, and then I said, that I told the truth after. I'm like, I just didn't think about it. I didn't want to run it up and like try to have a triple and we're up by 20 runs or whatever. Right. And they're like, did you know you needed a triple for the cycle? I'm like, I didn't. Like, I just didn't even think about it. I'm just thinking about winning. But isn't that, isn't that the mindset of a ball player? Like, you're not supposed to be doing it for you. Here, Okay, here's a question that I wanted to ask you. How hard is it to feel like you're a member of a team in a sport like baseball, which if we're being completely honest, it is an individual sport disguised as a team sport. There's no one else helping you through an at-bat. There's no wide receiver that is needed for this pass to be completed. There's no one to turn around and hand the ball off to. You are on your own, mano a mano against a pitcher. And, you know, now we live in a world where they tell you, well, RBIs, that's not even an important stat anymore because you didn't generate those runs. You just drove them in and whether the person was on base or not doesn't really affect where that ball went off your bat. And we've we've looked and deconstructed and reconstructed the game in so many ways. Do, do you believe that it is an individual sport more than it is a team sport or do you reject that almost? No, it's a team sport because you have to have that that. We all check our egos in at the door, and winning is the only thing that matters. And if we win, everything takes care of itself right. mentality. Like, if we have a parade, we're all getting paid. Um, and if we have a good season, we're all getting paid. But, like, there's nobody that can help you when you're in the batter's box against Randy Johnson. That's, that's you and him. But, like, if we have a team approach, and we're all going to ambush him on the first pitch, we're not going deep into account. So there, there's there's definitely team aspects of it. Um, and the, the teams that have more individuals by the way it was first pitch ambush day like one of the best days at the ballpark that sounds like a fun day it is because you don't have to think about your at bat we're all just going to get on the first strike that the guy throws but it's a team game plan because you don't want to get to two strikes because he's got a good out pitch and if you get the two strikes you're done right so we're not getting to two strikes we're getting them early um so yeah there is team out but nobody can help me when i'm standing in the batter's box facing him or anybody so there's individual aspects of every sport um but I think the teams that have the most individuals in baseball don't win. The teams that check their egos at the door. So one thing Joe Torre taught me, I went to the Yankees camp my last year, and he said, hey, we don't care who gets the credit here. Because if we win, and Mr. Steinbrenner is going to give us every opportunity to win, um, then we'll all get our credit. In the meantime, Jeter's over in the corner like, bullshit! No, no. He, <laughs> dude, he's, he's great. Like, he, we're still friends to this day after a spring training together. He's a great dude. Hilarious. Sneaky funny. Um, yeah. So that was a good experience for me to see like what it was like the inner workings of one of the most storied franchises in sports history. And it wasn't about, it was just like Jeter gets too much credit. Joe would be like, I get too much credit. Like Rocket gets too much credit. Jorge gets too much credit. Like if we win everything to take care of itself, but in baseball, Damon, with such a short shelf life of three or four years, average career, like you want to get your money, you want to take care of your family, you want to get your numbers. And it's hard to get a bunch of like guys with egos to right. check those at the door. There are, uh, for those who do not know, when I used to host 49er post game at Sam's Chowder House, FP was living in Half Moon Bay and he would come out 
and hang out and we'd like chat during commercial breaks. I'd always be like, you want to hop on the air? And he'd be like, no, I'm having beers. I'm just hanging out today. And then we would hang out and we'd talk after the show. And there are two things that I doubt you even remember that you said to me that have changed the way I think about sports and baseball in particular uh, for the rest of my life. The first thing you told me is never have sympathy for a professional athlete's travel schedule ever. Yeah. There's no such thing as that was a tough travel day for a major leaguer. It is that you will not travel better on your honeymoon than a major leaguer does flying into Kansas City. Yeah, but you can still be tired. Right, right, right. No, you weren't talking about, but you're just, you were talking about like the mechanics of it all. Like you're like, you don't touch a bag. You don't even have to collect your room key. It's basically there open for you when you get there. No, like the, you, The room keys are on a table in an envelope when you get there and it's got your name real big on it. The bus pulls up to the plane. The plane is a charter. It's like 757, 767. All the food you can eat, all the drink you can eat, unless you're flying back because you got to drive. But when you're flying to mm -hmm. or city to city, there's booze on the plane. Um, and then the bus pulls up to the plane on the tarmac. You get on the bus, go right to the hotel lobby, pick up your key, go to your room. They bring your luggage up. And you're at a Four Seasons most right. of the time. Right. So, yeah, that, that part's pretty damn cool. Yeah. I got used to that because I'm spoiled now. When I'm sitting middle seat, <laughs> I'm, I'm not staying in the Four Seasons. Like, that's ruined me for life. Totally. And I'm still spending... No Motel 6s after you stayed at the yeah. Four Seasons Lahaina. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I still spend too much money on hotels because of that. I there just you once go. you get used to it, it's hard to go. You know, the, the the taste of the glitzy life, it got you. What's uh, the other thing? The other thing was um that you the other thing you told me was like there's major league baseball and how every team operates, and then there's the New York Yankees. Yeah. And the New York Yankees, you feel the gravity of all time of the pinstripes when you're when you're you're in the Yankees. You're like, there was everything I ever did in baseball, and then there was Spring training with the Yankees and spring training with the Yankees is like as Major League Baseball as it like ever became. Yeah, as great as the Giants are, you feel like just the history there. And the Giants have great history. Yeah. I think the Giants have two of the greatest players that ever walked the face of the earth and Willie and Barry. Um, and when you're talking about that, and, and there's other guys that are, that are in the discussion, obviously, with the Yankees. But like the first day of camp, you pull up in the parking lot and all of a sudden you're like this. And there's an old man in a golf cart. And he's like taking you to breakfast and breakfast is like right there at legends field in tampa and there's a chef and all the yankees are sitting there and he's making you whatever you want for breakfast and it's just like when the bus pulls up for a spring training game it's like the beatles have arrived there's yeah. people like lining you can't the bus has to pull right up in their security and it's nuts in spring training and you'd be like dude this is nothing wait till the season i never got to experience that but like so yeah it's, it's the next level for sure and there's some people that can handle it some people that can't what is the pitching mound at Yankee Stadium? Is the loneliest place in the world, Proof, right? The Big Apple and the media and the attention. There's certain guys that thrive in that. Yeah. And there's certain guys that that, that shrivel in that. Did you uh, did you ever feel a difference in the stage that you were on, whether it be Montreal yeah. or Candlestick or no, playing in New York? Yeah. Yeah. As a visiting player, you feel it. You feel it when they're screaming at you. They're yelling at you. I remember sitting in left field in Yankee Stadium, and they're like, I was number seven, and they're screaming, there's only one number seven that stands in left field there, and you right. take off that number. Like, <laughs> like, oh, shit, no, you're, you're like, like, I'm not wearing a, a like, Yankee right. jersey. And I was like, Babe Ruth stood in this batter's box. Like, it, right. it, Yeah, and you just feel it. And then in the playoffs in 2001, um, we were the first playoff game in Yankee Stadium after 9-11, and they had Port Authority. Oh, my God, we that's Port, right. Port Authority, Port Authority, NYPD, NYFD. And they had the firefighters come right from ground zero and they had dust all over their jackets. And Joe and Paul O'Neill and everybody came out and hugged him. I'm with the A's. We're all wiping tears away, like on the third baseline for introductions. Then they raised the flag from the World Trade Center. It's all got holes in it. And then an eagle flies in with a game ball and they're, ch and they're chanting USA. And the single greatest moment of George W. Oh. Bush's presidency, he throws the greatest first pitch in Ever. the history of Major League Baseball. Ever. Ever. Well, that was for the World Series. This was the ALDS. Oh, oh, okay. But like, okay. this was the first playoff game after 9-11. Like, oh, I thought he did that one too. No, that was for the World Series against the oh, okay. Diamondbacks. Okay. But like Ground Zero was still smoking when we got there. Yeah. And just to see, they were chanting USA and 50,000 chanting USA before we even went on the field. And we lost game five uh, to the Yankees. And I kind of had a feeling that was my last big league game, and it was. So I sat in the dugout for like 15 minutes after the game in the visiting dugout. We lost the, the, the playoff series. And I was watching like the upper deck bounce, and they were chanting USA. And I'm like, I think they needed this more than we did. Like for just for like 
the people of New York right. needed that. I mean, I almost felt selfish if we would have won. Right. So the only time I ever rooted for the New York Yankees is, of course, the year the Diamondbacks won the World Series. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We were all kind of empathizing with yeah. what they were going through. Yeah. Um, to bring it back to, to San Francisco and this past baseball season, what did Kapler get right and what did Kapler get wrong? Oh, that, you know, it's, it, I, I don't like to talk about, like, people that, that are out of work, and I would never talk about anybody, to, like, that needs to lose their job. I would I would say, though, in hindsight, uh, Gabe was good to me. Like, we would have pre-series meetings with the broadcasters in his office. He was very open, and he would let us know things that we obviously couldn't use on the broadcast, but just to give us kind of to formulate our On opinions. background. Yeah, yeah. And, and and he was very candid and, and always great to me. Always go out of his way, give me a high five, say hi to me. So, like, the person... I've heard a lot of things said about him from people that don't know anything about him. I've heard a lot of things said about our city that people don't live here. So it's kind of a similar thing in that regard. He's a good dude, at least to me. And 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 uh, what I would say is I, I heard instances of meetings where he didn't speak. And I think when your team is going south and you're having a team meeting, it's incumbent on you as the, as the manager to stand up and say something. And I've, I've heard through the grapevine that he didn't. Um, and I think he believed in more on one-on-one -on -one meetings than the, the the big clubhouse thing. So um, as far as the game management goes, like I never saw eye to eye with Gabe when he was a manager of the Phillies. I would sit up in the booth and the Nats would play him 19 times a game. So he just had like a different philosophical take on how the game of baseball should be run mm -hmm. in order to have his team win a game than I did. I'm a little more old school uh, with a blend of new school and he's, he's all new school. Um, so in that regard, like, I, I just would like, whew, what are we doing? But who am I? I'm just like a dork that's not in the dugout. Um, so I would say, like, the number one thing that probably he could have done better, and maybe he would admit this, maybe he wouldn't, is, is like, toward the end, I think it's your job as a manager when things are going south. If things are hunky-dory, like, let, let the guys police the clubhouse. Right. But if they're policing the clubhouse and it ain't working, and there's some things that are going on the clubhouse that you don't like, and your team isn't winning, like, Art Howe never said a word to us. We stayed out till four in the morning every night. We came to the locker room hung over for day games. Right, and you rolled we, out of bed and won 100 games. We, we won. We were 101. We were 162. 100, yeah, 162 that year. Um, so if your clubhouse is policing itself, and we we policed each other, like if guy like Zito was 22, like Barry, you need to get some sleep tonight. Like you go out five nights in a row, you look like shit. We police ourselves, and the whole thing was to win. So if the policing yourself thing isn't working, your season's slipping away. To me. Um, and, and what do I know? I wasn't a part of it. I wasn't there. I could be way off on this. You have to be in the clubhouse to know this. And I wasn't, um, I think from what I've heard, like, I think it's a manager. Your job is to like nip those things in the bud and be like, dude, this ain't working. And I got to take charge. And I don't know if that was done. It could have been, but I, what I've heard, and, and that's all secondhand. You know, when, when, when Kapler, when I knew it was like, oh, this is not going to end well for him is when he was explaining a pinch hitting situation and he wanted to clarify that he doesn't pinch hit for someone. He pinch hits with someone. I, I would have loved to have gave to just say, like, I screwed that up so bad tonight. Just look into the camera and be like, I really screwed that up. Yeah, that's no, and, and but that's the thing. But like, I don't, I don't, like, I don't think he ever did players, that. Players don't give a shit about your political correctness or how you phrase it. They cared about being pulled from the lineup or not knowing if they're coming to the ballpark and playing that day. There's people or who's in platooning. the jersey. Always remember that. Yeah. There's people in that uniform. Right. And That's not have, an equation in there. You have to treat them like human beings. Yeah. Like you love them, like you care about them. Authenticity plays in any line of work, but especially in a locker room where you're with each other eight months out of the year. I think Farhan's really good at the back of the roster. The problem is the starting nine. Fair or foul? I... I Man, I don't know anything about constructing a roster. What, what I mean, if, if I he, mean, you need nine major league. That's the thing. They, you need you need an everyday lineup. This whole we platoon everything every day. Fall, everything. Yeah. Well, I need I need a major league lineup. I need a first baseman who plays 155 games a year and 162 unless he's a pussy. I agree. I agree 100. percent Yeah. I agree from a success standpoint, uh, and I agree from a fan standpoint because I've been a Giants fan longer than I've been associated with the organization that. If I drive two hours to a game, I want to fall in love with my players like I did when I was a kid. Yeah. Dwayne Kuyper was my favorite giant for a while. Then it was Will Clark. Then it was Robbie Thompson. You know, then it then it was, uh, I liked Mike Aldretti for a year. And, and I just fell in love with like all these players as a kid and I would emulate them. Who's your favorite bum giant? 
Oh, I don't know. They're none of them. I mean, I mean, I mean not bum, but you know what I mean. John, bum, Johnny, yeah. Johnny, Johnny Lynn Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, mean, I told you. I, I, as, as I grew up a Cub fan, I was a big Hector Villanueva guy. Yeah, but, like, you fell in love with the players, and you wanted to, like, emulate them, and I wore my uni like them, and um, I learned how to be a switch hitter because of Will Clark because we would play wiffle ball every night in high school at this tennis court, and my right-handed swing was with the yellow wiffle ball bat. And then I would get to like American Legion or high school ball and my bat felt like it weighed like a telephone pole. So I'd start hitting left-handed and I would emulate Will like pulling it up and doing the Cape finish. And I was raking left-handed and all my buddies were like, why don't you try that in American Legion ball? I was 17 years old. And I did and I got two hits because of like emulating Will Clark in wiffle ball. So like, I think like for kids and, and youngsters that are Giants fans, like they want to, we all want to fall in love with these guys again. We want to fall. Do you see how much we fell in love with Casey Schmidt after a week? Yeah. Like we fell in love with uh, Patrick Bailey for good reason. Like Giants fans want to fall in love with their players. They don't want to drive two hours and see him hit twice and get pinch hit for. Her. And they don't want to, they don't want to drive an hour and a half from Sacramento and not know who's pitching or see John Brebbia starting for the third day in a row. Like they want to see, Tim Litzikum or, or Yamamoto or um, just name anybody. Oh, like Yamamoto's Harrison. on the team. Did he? Did he? Did he sign? Was he? I hope so. <laughs> That'd be great. Oh man, uh, what do you think of uh, was it uh, Jun Hu Lee? Yeah, Jun Hu Lee. Is that? I, I don't the, know. The, the, say, yeah. yeah, the the, 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 get the, cor- in the Korean the Korean player that the Giants just gave. What sixteen, nineteen million dollars a year to who is playing in what the equivalent of maybe double A ball over there? I mean, I don't. It, it feels like a reach. It feels like here's the thing. It's definitely not Shohei Otani. It's definitely not. It's well, decidedly but, not Shohei Otani. Well, I'll say this, and this is based on a YouTube highlight video. Uh, I like some of his, his mannerisms, his actions. They need to get more athletic. You watch him play center field. He's fast. Um, he's got a great setup, a great swing. Uh, people talking about he can't hit a major league fastball. I saw him get hits off uh, maybe Yamamoto even. Okay. Uh, and, and, and Otani, a 95 fastballs right inside, getting get in his hands. He's a great bad ball hitter. He struck out 32 times last year. I don't know anything about him other than a YouTube video, but I do know the Giants have to get more athletic. Like, that's what the game has evolved into. you got to steal bases now. you got to play defense. you got to cover ground, i.e. the Diamondbacks. That to me, that to me is where— or the, 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 Like, they're the, they're the model for what yeah, you should be as an organization. Right this now. is where Farhan got caught sleeping on an equation that wasn't tailored to the new rules and the pace of the game. He's still playing stationary baseball where it's officially time to start the merry-go-round again. Yeah, but if you've signed guys to contracts— you're kind of married to that, yeah. even if the game changes, and you're like, oh, okay. Right. And I think he knows. He knows. I think he's learned a lot. Of, the only thing I've ever been critical about Farhan was last year's, don't tell me what you're going to do. Just do it. Right. Just like lay in the weeds. We're doing our due diligence. We're going right. to— Under promise, over deliver, not the other yeah, way around. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's just from an enthusiastic standpoint that he wanted to please the fan base. But then if things don't get through, you, you, things don't get settled, like you're setting yourself up for failure— and I think he hasn't said a word this offseason. That's kind of how you go about it. He's learning. I mean, we're all learning. He's evolving. He, they, he's maybe realizing that that even two or three years ago when they won 107 games, that that's not the same formula to win in right now with the new rules and the way the game has evolved. It's always changing, just like we are as people, Damon Bruce. Oh, look at that. <laughs> look, at, look at that. Look at that. Uh, favorite giant to watch last year was? Bailey and Logan Webb. Logan, Logan's, Logan's old school, man. He, yeah. he gets it, gets it. He gets it, gets it, gets it. He's like, yeah, that guy could have played. He re- in the, dude, he reminds me era, of Matt Cain. He any, reminds any me of Matt Cain. He really does. And even with the lack of run support, just to put the final flourish on it, too. I mean, he really reminds me of Matt Cain. Yeah, I, lo- I love ba- Bailey how mature he is. Um, I think he just was fatigued at the end of the year. He couldn't even, like, formulate a game plan at the plate. He was just swinging right. and throwing the ball into right center field because he was so beat up. I don't think people understand what a marathon that, that sport is. A mental marathon. Yeah. The physical part, uh, yeah, everybody's banged up. But like grinding every night for 162 games on every pitch that's coming or every pitch you're throwing or every ground ball that's coming to you, every fly ball that's coming to you, they're like you just get to a point where you're just like, oh, man, I don't want to think tonight. Sometimes you just go up and swing because I don't want to think tonight. Like it's hard to think. It's really hard to think after about five months. It's got to be. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's. It's hard to think in general for me. But 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 uh, that's the thing. It's whatever you think about. You're not trying to please forty thousand people cheering for you at the end of what you ever thought about right. being a, the pressure of a modern athlete 
is extraordinary. It's extraordinary. And it's amazing how an awful lot of money, an awful lot of fame, an awful lot of exposure is just a toxic a mix as it is something to really celebrate for some Ooh, people. I've seen guys deal with success worse than failure. Totally. I, see, I saw guys change right in front of my eyes with like, they got a contract, they got money, they got cars, they got earrings now, they got jewelry now, they got tattoos everywhere now. They're doing things off the field they never did before. And I've seen, like, failure, in base, baseball failure is ingrained in you. Like, you feel seven out of ten times you're in the Hall of Fame. But, like, success isn't. So when you see guys that get the big contract that maybe aren't as grounded as others, they let that I've seen so many guys just get the big contract. And I'm just like, who are you, dude? Like, well, who are you? I don't even know who you are anymore. Like, what, like, and you try to reel them in and there's, you just can't. Is it a certain pair of sunglasses that they always walk into the clubhouse with and you're like, uh-oh, that's a sunglass crowd now. Yeah, that. And maybe they just start choking people on the basketball court and, and, and swinging at them and stuff. Who was the hottest teammates? Who was the hottest head teammate that you played with? And how did you go about policing that teammate? Oh, it's David Segui easily. He broke something after every at bat. Really? I didn't police him because I kind of did the same thing. Okay. I, I, yeah, we used to go in the tunnel and beat up trash cans and beat up. Yeah. It's frustrating, man. It, the, the, the baseball drive you nuts. And if you don't, if I didn't get it out, I felt like I was given in. So I would go like do my little tantrum and come back in the dugout. And he he was, boy, he would do it every at bat all season long. <laughs> it's funny. I don't remember David Segui being a hothead no, you, you never or saw it. anything. You never I don't, saw yeah, it. I don't you remember would, a frisky David Segui at all. You would see like, because Montreal was quiet, you would see the other teams in field like putting their gloves on their face laughing because they could hear him in the back going, fuck, fuck, just breaking stuff and just like, <laughs> Like for like five minutes and they're all out there laughing because you could hear it like from the tunnel out on the field. That's awesome. That's all. Now, now how, how, how was it dealt with or is it just not no, dealt just, with? Yeah, it's whatever. It's a big I mean, deal. that's the thing. It was also the early nineties and the world was different. Oh, Mid nineties. Yeah. I mean, it's just, a, it was it's just a different world. Green greenies were great. <laughs> Green, yeah. Dude, people <laughs> act differently. People did different things. People talked a different way. They acted a different way. They weren't concerned that everything out of their mouth be the most sanitized scrubbed thing that has ever been said. You know, I'm, I'm, everything I say was not built to make sure it invokes the least amount of outrage possible. And on the other side of that, you had a whole bunch of people just watching, not looking for things to be outraged about. Like it's the, the sender and the receiver have both been broken in modern communication. Dude, your night show when I first got to say, you couldn't do that same show right now. Like, no you way. You used to say so many things. And I'd be like, how is he getting away with that? Yeah. <laughs> now you couldn't say half that. Larry Bear thought the same thing. I'd <laughs> <laughs> be totally honest with you. But yeah, no, it was, uh, it was a different world. It was an absolute different world and I miss it. It's, it's, I, I really feel like, you know, you and I are about the same age yeah. and it's like, we grew up in the last age of true, like American innocence. And, and not that we were innocent, not that we were, you know, little Lord Fauntleroy's over there, but we, you were able to behave in a fun manner, which was like a good kind of self-destructive that didn't get you canceled in the world or in society. Like I've always said, if Facebook had existed when I had been in college, I would have been unemployable for the entirety of my life. No one would have hired me. I would have never been hired at KNBR. I would have never been hired anywhere. I'd be, I would be I would be a bum. I'd be sleeping in an alley just based on, well, look at your Facebook page between the years of 1992 and 1997. <laughs> that alone means you can't work here forever. Yeah, that whole thing about going backwards, and it, that, that, that always gets me, about going backwards and going through people's stuff from 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Isn't it weird? It's not... Like if the speed limit was 45, 30 years ago and you're driving 75 now and yeah, I, I don't get it, but I'm going to, you're going to give me a ticket for going too fast 30 years ago, but the speed limit was that or whatever, you're right? Gonna, whatever that analogy, that shitty one I'm trying to use. You're on to something. Yeah. There's no doubt. You're on to something. Oh, you just look at, look, speaking of technology, you just got tweeted on your wristwatch there, Batman. I do. I went an hour without checking my phone. That's a new record. Is that a new record? Dude, well, I'm going to tell you, we've been talking for an hour and 20 minutes and it feels like we've been doing this for 15 minutes. It's so easy to talk to you. You yeah. are, I mean, I, dude, I've, I've always appreciated 
you as a person, I've always appreciated you as a ball player. I've always appreciated you as a broadcaster. I'm an FP Santangelo kind of guy, if you don't mind me saying. Oh, I'm, dude, a, I'm a season I, ticket holder. Dude, I, I appreciate that. I'm a Damon Bruce kind of guy, too. Thank I've you. always been in your corner, dude. Always. Thank you. Thank you very much. It, and it, Yes. So it, it's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, hopefully people go to FP in a pod. Or we could just keep doing this. I don't care. Well, here's the thing. I, you, I, wait, let me see if I can clear my schedule. Let me see. Uh, <laughs> You free? I'm free. <laughs> well, let's do this again sometime, for All sure. Right, let's right. absolutely do this again. It was wonderful to have you here today. Obviously, they're not going to have any club plus or anything like that. Uh, I always wrap up my show to this day, FP, still saying to this day that sports don't build character. They reveal it. But since this is your first guest appearance, would you please sign off with your line? Swing hard in case you hit it.